In this video, I want to take a look at primitive data types. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do we need to know about primitive data types when we're going to be looking at data structures and obviously a lot more complex data structures? Well, the reason is they're the foundation for everything that we're going to build upon. And so we have to make sure we understand them and we understand them and how they work with different languages because data structures is really language independent. It does not matter if you're using Python, if you're using JavaScript, or you're using Java or C++ or anything else. These are language agnostic, meaning it doesn't matter. We can port these to other languages and we can use them and take the advantages of knowing how to use them. In many cases, we'll find that they even come with a language, but we have to know how to use them. And so it's important that we understand how we use them, not just based upon what a language describes it as, but so we can build it, modify it, change it, etc. So let's take a look real quick at some examples that we might see. And you might think, well, why do I have to know about the primitive data types if I'm using something like JavaScript or Python, which is a typeless language? Well, the answer is that they only appear in reality to be typeless. That's because in reality, they actually do typing. They just do it behind the scenes. They hide it from you, the developer, so you don't have to know it. So let's take a quick look at some code. So I'm going to show you a couple pieces of code, very similar in the way it works, uh, but I'm going to show you in two different languages just so you can see how they work and whatnot. In this example, we have some Python code, and I have age equals 10, I have valid equals true, and name equals data structures. So I'm going to use the print command so I can print some of this stuff out. I say print age, and if I go and run this, down below it's going to show me, hey, age is 10. Okay, that's what I expect. So in this, we actually have three different data types. We have an integer, a Boolean, and a string. Two of these are primitives, and that's your age and your Boolean. Your string is actually a complex data type, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit. But I want to show you just something real quick and let you know that things are not always what they seem. And if we're not careful, and this is especially true of these so-called typeless languages, we can get ourselves into trouble. And that means that errors, whether they be runtime or logic, are going to tend to crop up. So what I want to do is I'm going to say print age, but I want to add or want to concatenate these two values together. And if I say valid and run this, I don't get an error. I get a value. In fact, I get 11. And so true, which is a Boolean value, is showing to have a numeric value of 1. And that's a little weird because a Boolean should be true or false, not 1 or some other number. But as we look at Boolean values, we'll understand why that happens in just a minute. Now, can I do the same thing with age and name? Notice once again, I do not get any error messages that are coming up in my editor. I go to run and here I get an error. And this is one of the most common types of errors that I see a lot of new developers making in languages like Python. Uh, Python is, is great for giving these uh, errors that deal with what they call a type error or the inability to convert types automatically. It doesn't know how to do it. So in this case, it's the difference between a type int and a type string, and it falls apart. JavaScript is also known for this, and it creates some sometimes hysterical results. And I say hysterical because they're not happening to me right now. Uh, in real life, when you get them, you can run into them and go, oh, why did it do that? And it's because it was trying to figure out how do I merge these two different data types and they're less likely to give errors, but more likely to give you bad data, which can be worse. It makes it actually harder to debug and harder to test in advance. So uh, even with these 
supposedly typeless languages, they're still tight behind the scenes. Very few languages are truly typeless. Now let's take a look at Java. And Java is a typed language and we have loosely strict and we have tightly strict languages and we're not going to go really into the details of that. That's more of a compiler theory, you know, programming languages type of question. You'll notice that when we declare a variable here, just like in C or C++, we have to specify uh, our data type and we specify our variable name. We don't have to specify a value right away if we don't want to. Uh, in this case, I am just for simplicity's sake. Here I have int age equals 10, boolean valid is equal to false. If I go to say system.out.println_age, so I can print it to the screen, it will go and print and it displays 10 for me, just like I would expect. What happens if I try to say, well, I want to do age and I want to add valid? Well, Java being a typed language says that, wait a second, these two types are not compatible. There are data types that are compatible, and I can add integers and longs, or I can add a double and a float, but these are two different types. And so valid does not give you a, oh, well, let's make it a one, like Python does. So this is something that's just different to the language, and we have to understand that, understand how our language is going to work. So while these concepts work over any language, certain languages are going to make certain things easier or harder. In this case, it makes it easier to catch errors. Let's look at our primitive data types. And our primitive data types, like I said, are things like your integers, your Boolean. There are also going to be other numeric data types, like your single float, which is usually referred to as a float. Some languages will call it a single. A double precision floating point, which most languages call a double. Uh, you will also have things like a long integer, which most languages call long, your Boolean data type, which we mentioned, and also a single character, sometimes referred to as a char. All of those tend to be actually numeric in basis. And what that means is that things like my Boolean, which seem very simple, it only needs to be a single bit to handle, that Boolean data type uh, is actually going to be usually a whole uh, byte, maybe two bytes, depending upon how it's easy to read. That's, once again, more of a computer architecture and programming language perspective. We're not going to worry about that. It's going to hold a true or false value. In some older languages, like C, uh, a lot of times any value that was zero was considered to be false, and any non-zero value was considered to be true. And that's kind of where Python kind of got that idea from, where it said that it was true, so it made it 1, because 1 was most commonly used for a true value. So a lot of languages do that, but not all of them. Visual Basic was a good example of where they used 1 and negative 1 for true and false, and just, you know, as a different type of example. But it's always numeric and basis, and the reason why is how we build our data internally. And if we go to uh, the computer when it's compiling our code, it looks at this and says, okay, I need a place to store my data when I create a variable. And instead of the variable name, it actually looks for a memory location. And that name is just mapped to a memory location. The data type is going to tell it how many bytes does it need to use. Now, in the olden days, integers were usually only two bytes, and then they went to four. Uh, and the reason why is as we got bigger processors and more RAM, they could do that. That allows us to have bigger numbers, but there are limits. Let's take an example, and I have a link in the web page to this, and you can take a look at this. But in converting your bits into bytes, there are eight bits that make up a single byte. And this is in most modern computer architecture. There are some that are different, but most standard PC, whether it's Macintosh or Windows or Linux, you're using an eight-bit byte.
And if you had a single byte, you could use between negative 128 or positive 127. That's standard, okay? Two bytes is going to give you approximately plus or minus 32,000 or approximately zero to 65,000 if you're using unsigned. With four bytes, you can go up to plus or minus two billion. In languages like Java and Python, you can't do unsigned. That's more of a C and C++ thing. Uh, so we'll stick with the approximate plus or minus two billion. And you might say, well, how is that? Well, let's take an example here. This little JavaScript tool that I built, you'll notice I have here a series of bits and we'll see that these are turned off. And we're going to use two's complement math. So if I turn on the first one, you'll notice that I get a value of one. Well, I can turn that off and I now have zero as my selected value as nothing is turned on. I'm going to turn on my third bit and notice that it is four. So if I kind of work within the, myself and I start thinking about, okay, how's my comp, my math complements going to work out? I can start to see, okay, well, I have uh, zero or one, and then I have two, then I have four, eight, etc. And so as I turn these on, these values go up. And if I need something that's between 16 and my next one is 32, I'll turn on some of these to my right. So I might turn on these two and get the number of 22 to get those values. If I need an odd value, that last one will give me 1, which will give me 23, as you see there. So I can go all the way up if all of these are turned on. I can go up to 255, and this is because it is non-signed. This is just real simple. If I was using integer math that was signed, my first or last one, depending upon wh whether I'm reading left to right or right to left and what architecture I'm going to use, would be a signed bit that would tell me if I'm positive or negative. So we're just doing it really simple here. You can see that as I use more bits and turn more bits on, I can get larger and larger numbers. If I want to go to 256, I need a second byte. I'm going to go up and up and up. If I need 3 billion positive, I can't do that with 4 bytes, not in an integer value. I have to do something different, and so I have to figure out, okay, how is that going to work? Is it going to work? with using another set of information, go into a different data structure, uh, like a long, do I have to go to a float, etc. Now, floating point number is going to be quite a bit different. That's going to have decimal places. Uh, we sometimes in mathematics, we think of them as a real number. In fact, some computer languages I've used have actually called them reals instead of floats. The question is, how do you store a decimal place inside of a variable, inside of an integer number like that? Well, you can't. And so if you go into the ANSI standards, what you will find is that it's actually using a mathematical representation, and it stores it basically as a fraction. How many bits are designated to each side of that fraction for your numerator and denominator? and how many bytes you're going to take up overall is depending upon the ANSI standard, as well as if you're using a single precision floating point, like a float, or a double precision floating point, like a double. So in either one of those, though, integers or longs, which gives you more bytes, single precision floats or doubles, any of those numbers, you can reach the end of your number. And so that's always something we have to keep in mind is what happens if we go beyond that. Now, in real life, we typically don't hit those limits. That does not mean we never will, though. So we always have to be on the lookout. How are we going to handle a situation like that, especially if we're dealing with really large or really small numbers, especially if we're dealing with floating point numbers. So these are our most common types of primitive data types that we're going to look at and we're going to use. 
these are the foundations that we're going to build everything on top of.